traditionally the definition of drag just generally was uh, men dressing as women and women dressing as men for the in the context of performance. But my go-to definition of drag is a kind of performance that comments on gender. Want to listen to this episode ad-free? Head on over to our Patreon, patreon.com slash ivory tower boiler room and get a free trial for the itbr professor level and you can actually watch this episode as a video episode as well while you're at it did you know that on spotify we now have a subscription service for ten dollars a month you get access to all of our ad free episodes plus any bonus episodes So make sure that you rate, review, and follow the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Make sure that you follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Ivory Tower Boiler Room. And follow Mary DePippi's show, True Crime in Academia, at True Crime in Academia. Thank you all for your support. And without further ado, here's today's episode. Sorry for the interruption, but this is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and I have to talk to you all about the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Yes, you might be saying, but wait, aren't I listening to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room? You are. You're listening to the podcast. But when I'm not here in the podcast space, I'm actually consulting. So I have small businesses that I help consult with their social media marketing plan. I help fellow podcasters or those who are looking to go into podcasting. And I've also just met with a client and I can't wait for her podcast to come out. So I've also helped those in the college admission process with their essay editing. I helped someone on her thesis and actually edited and helped consult her all the way through her thesis. I'll help you with your dissertation since I just got done my dissertation uh, last summer. So you can reach out to me at ivorytowerboiltheroom at gmail.com. Yes, I monitor my email every day. My first hour consultation is done virtually usually, and it's $30 for the first hour, and then we'll figure out what plan will work for you. So again, you can reach out to me via email, or you can also look me up on Google, Ivory Tower Boiler Room. You'll see my cell phone number there. Please do feel free to call me or DM me on Ivory Tower Boiler Room's Instagram. This episode is brought to you by Snapple. Welcome to the Snapple Market Auditory Experience. Close your eyes. Imagine you're walking into your neighborhood store. You make your way to the back and reach for your favorite Snapple flavor. You can't wait. You take a sip. Whoa, that's a lot of flavor. Mm -hmm. What flavor are you holding? Now open your eyes and check out Snapple.com to find ridiculously flavorful Snapple near you. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Baker's, where you'll find over 30,000 mouth-watering choices that excite your inner foodie. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week. You can also save up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with fuel points. More savings and more inspiring flavors make shopping Baker's worth it every time. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and welcome back to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. I am joined with a fellow sexuality study-minded scholar, Dr. Jacob Bloomfield. I want to tell you a little bit about Jacob. First, um, the book that we're going to be discussing is really exciting, but Jacob Bloomfield has a few fellowships. I will let him tell you about one of them because I can't pronounce the name, but his other that I can pronounce is an honorary research fellow at the University of Kent. His research is primarily in the fields of cultural history, the history of sexuality and gender history. He, in his bio, said he was currently finishing a monograph, but I have it here and I'm holding it up for all of you who can see the video. It is a beautiful book called Drag a British History from the University of California. It's about drag performance in modern Britain. But before I get into that, I have a lot of questions to ask him about it. And he is also, it says, undertaking work on the career and legacy of the musician Little Richard, which sounds quite exciting. So, Jacob, welcome. And if you want to say the name of your other postdoctoral fellowship, I would really appreciate it. 
Yes, yeah, so thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Jacob, as you just kindly mentioned, and uh, I'm a Zukunfts colleague postdoctoral fellow at the University of Konstanz. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so first, I was just curious, how did you get into the field of sexuality studies? Like, is this something that happened from your PhD experience and studies, something in undergrad, or even this begins with Jacob in high school? Well, uh, my mind has always been in the gutter, Andrew, and, uh, <laughs> but um, it, formally in terms of my study of the history of sexuality, well, I mean, uh, how Freudian do we want to get about uh, <laughs> why I'm into this topic? I mean, in high school, uh, I was very obsessed with Prince, the musician. Um, so, and obviously sex is uh, something that uh, his songs deal with uh, quite a lot most fa uh, famously. Um, so, uh, but in terms of the kind of formal study of the history of sexuality, this started out uh, in my master's year uh, at the University of Edinburgh. Um, I read an article by Charles Upchurch, uh, mm -hmm. whom some of your uh, listeners might know about. Uh, he's a historian of uh, Britain. Yes. He's um, been on our show. He's a friend okay. of our show. Okay, friend so of continue. the show, Doc Upchurch. Um, so yes, uh, so friend of the church, friend of the show, Charles Upchurch is a big inspiration. Yeah. And uh, Professor Upchurch read an article on uh, the Bolton and Park case, which was a case involving two um, drag performers, female impersonators, as they were called then, but they also. Uh, cross-dressed in their private lives and in public offstage and they were arrested in 1870 in London for conspiracy to commit sodomy and then the subsequent court case kind of revolved around the extent to which uh, drag on stage and off uh, was indicative of sexuality particularly homosexuality and they were acquitted eventually actually so um, the prosecution wasn't able to definitively prove this connection between drag and sexuality. And uh, this is one of the reasons, by the way, that I, why I start my chronology, the book's chronology in 1870. So anyway, that uh, inspired me to look a little bit more about, uh, a little bit more into drag. And I was very surprised that um, the history of British drag uh, hadn't, um, you know, there, there were some great books. Uh, I stand on the shoulders of giants, as they say. So for instance, Lawrence Senelec's book, uh, which is like a global history of cross-dressing performance, uh, is great. Um, but, you know, there were very few sources that focused specifically on the history of British drag performance. Um, and so my master's dissertation was focusing on uh, representations of male cross-dressing in British and American film. And then my PhD thesis was about uh, drag performance, male drag performance in Britain from 1918 to 1970. And then the book expands that slightly uh, to look at drag history from 1870 to 1970. Well, and this is a great transition because I was going to ask you who is on the foundation or the precipice of allowing you to dive deep into male drag performance. Like I'm thinking there's a book called Vested Interests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'm Marjorie pretty Garber. sure. Um, okay, who is the author, Jacob? Marjorie Garber wrote uh, Vested Marjorie Interests. Garber. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, when you were looking into queer studies, like I know this is jumping to the end of your book, but you have this really fascinating just question about, you know, is drag queer? And I'm curious, do you feel that the field of queer studies has greatly changed like since you went into academic work on drag performance or do you think that it is still um, a misunderstood aspect of queer studies and there's still more of a slant or an angle on same sex desire, even um, aspects of identity categories like identity sexuality mm -hmm. categories. Uh, supersede, say, the performativity of drag or masquerade or, you know, the ballroom scene of pose? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for your question. I mean, um, for the most part, I think the field of sexuality studies and 
queer history, etc., is great <laughs> being a part of that. Um, you know, my book um, doesn't aim to be contrarian and uh, tell me if you'd like, if I'm not answering a part of your question here. But um, I'd like to say, first of all, to answer your question, that my book doesn't aim to be contrarian. It's not saying, oh, you know, you, the reader, might think of drag as a queer art form, but it isn't actually, you know what I mean? Um, basically, I'm trying to contextualize people's preconceived notions of modern drag. So, and I think kind of this, uh, the idea we have of modern drag comes out of this cultural moment in 1870, where you have, for instance, um, the uh, emergence of, let's say, proto-sexology, which leads into more formal sexology, um, sexual modernism. Uh, you have things like the Bolton and Park case. You have just the growth of the music hall in general, which brings drag along with it. You have the emergence of the pantomime dame and the growth of what we today might call glamour drag. Um, so I kind of want to explain uh, the background of, you know, where all these concepts that we associate with drag came about, um, how they came about and uh, whether they bear out in the past, I guess you could say. Um, so in terms of the question of drag being a queer art form, uh, as you said in the uh, epilogue of the book. And my answer to that is drag has long held fascination for same-sex desiring and gender non-conforming audience members and practitioners. And so you definitely can't deny that connection. Um, uh, and I don't try to, again, I'm not trying to be contrarian and the book can be read as a queer studies book, but also, uh, we, there are other associations that people have had both on the practitioner side and on the audience side that people have had with drag in the past and um, the queer element shouldn't necessarily overshadow that. I think the example I use is you know, basically we should see drag as an art form like any other and people don't often essentialize other art forms. You know, people don't often say that watercolor painting only means one thing. Um, and similarly, historically, yes, drag has been a queer art form, but drag has also had many other meanings. And I dig into those other meanings um, throughout the book. And I'm not the only one making that argument. For example, you mentioned Marjorie Garber. Marjorie Garber has also dis discussed that in a vested interest as well. But I'm sort of pushing that argument forward. forward. So I guess when I said, is drag queer, that's not the same thing as how queer is drag. I mean, are those okay. questions... Well, I'm just asking you, are they like just hypothetically spitballing? Are those different questions? Is how queer is drag different than is drag queer? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I would say, yes, drag is queer. Uh, I guess my answer, if so, maybe they're different questions, but I think they have the same answer. Um, and I think I even say in that epilogue, drag is a queer art form as a single sentence, but drag also means many other things and has meant many other things. Um, and um, and also I think we need to think about the diversity of ways in which people responded to the queerness of drag. I think there's a sort of, um, again, a preconceived notion that people might have that uh, observers in the past saw drag as indicative of sexuality in some way and then those observers tended to see that as a bad thing. And that was not the case. And even the people who, you know, if they saw a drag show and perceived it as relating to sexuality and they thought that that was a bad thing, the next reaction, um, you know, varied. Some people thought, okay, drag is connected to sexuality, therefore we should stamp it out. Some people said drag is connected to sexuality, but uh, what are you gonna do? Let's just, <laughs> let's just, you know, um, keep it going as is. So, you know, you have this, even among the negative reactions, you have uh, a spectrum between, you know, censure and begrudging tolerance and all sorts of um, reactions in between. And then there are lots of audience members, many of them ostensibly straight, who uh, were attracted to drag shows because of the its relation to sexuality. So I, I talk about letters um, 
written to uh, periodicals such as London Life, which express a sexual fascination with drag. Um, and so, uh, so again, I'm trying to, uh, so I say, yes, drag is a queer art form, but dot, dot, dot. And then I try to contextualize that further throughout the book. Well, and something that I want everyone out there to know is, like you've already mentioned, your chronology is mostly looking at the history of the late 1800s into the early 1900s of, like, right, 1960, right before Stonewall. So it's like all this pre-Stonewall up until the mm -hmm. 1969 moment, in a way, mm -hmm. that with this bookmark, I also think of what has been sanctioned drag, like meaning by the heterosexual community, like something that mm -hmm. comes to my mind is South Pacific, the musical. There's all the um, sailors and there's nothing mm -hmm. like a dame. They also yeah. are dressing up eventually in this um, pageantry costume in dresses. And I just find mm -hmm. it so interesting. Like, how do you feel about what society see deems as acceptable drag compared to what is seen as pathological? from all of your studies, because we do have a lot of soldier examples of yeah. drag. Yeah, thanks for that question. I mean, um, it is often in the eye of the beholder. And so I open up with an anecdote about a drag show uh, called We Are No Ladies that uh, took place in 1958. And then I go into all the reactions um, this show elicited from people and some people wrote into the Lord Chamberlain's office and the Lord Chamberlain's office was Britain's state theater censor from 1737 to 1968. And uh, some people wrote into Lord Chamberlain's office saying this is quote unquote homosexual filth. Um, but then also the employee that the Lord Chamberlain's office sends to the theater to observe this, to observe the show says, you know, he, uh, this employee saw an audience of quote unquote respectable looking people um, laughing at often kind of camp <laughs> humor on display. Um, and then you have the Lord Chamberlain's office itself saying, well, we think this show is a little bit rude, but there's nothing we can do to shut it down overall. You know, it's not our cup of tea, but it's fine. And they even say, and by the way, um, female impersonation is a theatrical cultural tradition in this country. And so we can't just stamp out female impersonation, full stop. So, uh, you know, in that anecdote, you have people perceiving drag as homosexual filth. You have people perceiving drag as a, just a fun night out at the theater. You have um, a, ostensibly straight audience members coming but, you know, they enjoy that sort of connection to uh, what we might term today a queer subculture. They think that so they're having knowledge of these camp jokes makes them feel kind of in the know. Um, and it's sort of a safe way for them to engage in queer subculture. Um, you have uh, the Lord Chamberlain's office is expressing begrudging tolerance and also acknowledging drag's place as a a uh, theatrical tradition, which should be preserved. Um, so yeah, people had all sorts of different reactions. Um, and um, uh, the most interesting, I think, um, and this is probably the vast majority of people, but it's difficult to get a hold of these opinions because they're the neutral ones. Is, you know, I'm interested in the people who went to see these drag shows and uh, they saw it as just regular light entertainment and they left the show and didn't think about the show five minutes afterwards. And if you think about it, we are sort of the weird ones for connecting drag to, you know, to drag to sexuality. If somebody is playing like a doctor on stage, a medical doctor, we don't think, oh, you know, what's their pathology? Maybe they wanted to be a medical doctor since they were young or whatever. And yet when we you know, see uh, someone in drag, we think about their offstage sexual life, for example. Um, and I think it's actually quite normal uh, for people in the past to have gone to see a drag show and then, and they didn't associate it or with sexuality and didn't think about the performer's offstage life. And then just my last point, um, sometimes you do see um, 
acknowledgement of drag's connection with sexuality, but uh, there's a sense that people are put at ease. So for instance, um, I'll give you an example. Uh, and you mentioned this before, I talk about a troop called La Rouge et Noir and La Rouge et Noir were ex-servicemen who served in the First World War and they did drag shows for their fellow soldiers during the war and then took these drag shows and toured um, all over Britain during the interwar period. They were the stars of one of the very first uh, British made talkies ever produced uh, talkie films. So they were very popular. And um, you know, there's a quote uh, or there's a review of one of their shows which says, by the way, Red Stone, the star drag performer, doesn't um, doesn't give any hint of the Nancy type. And Nancy was a way of saying effeminate homosexual. So you see sort of um, sometimes uh, in that, uh, things like that where, oh, just, you know, yeah, we know some people aren't into this sort of thing, but everything here is above board, don't worry. Um, so, uh, so, so people can go into a drag show thinking, oh, maybe this will be related to sexuality, but they're put at ease, um, by either like the technical quality on display or the jokes being relatively wholesome, maybe the performers being ex-servicemen, for example, et cetera. So how do you connect this to the way that a masculinity works in our current culture and, you know, I'm going to blow the lid off your uh, historical uh, periodization because I feel that we're now in a moment where uh, movies like Tootsie, Mrs. Doubtfire, um, even Eddie Murphy's films, right? Like, I forget the name, but he would has all these films where he plays all these different women. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think of how masculine... A masculinity is actually hyper masculinized because an actor portrays a woman, but it's in this context of drag. I mean, we can even get into how straight actors play transgender women, um, mm -hmm. a la and Eddie Redmayne um, and the Danish girl. Like, mm -hmm. how does that function in terms of do you think that it's a really different register the way that, you know, masculinity is working now when people play women? Or do you think... Mm -hmm. Um, and I do want to say there's a distinction that you're making right between male drag performers and the transgender community. Like even when it comes to acting, these are very different. A Mrs. Doubtfire is different than a Danish girl. Like there are different yep. narratives. So, you know, how does this current resonance and argument of masculinity function even in the period you were looking at? I really wanted to introduce you all to one of our sponsors, Broadview Press, who's been here since the beginning of the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Broadview Press is an independent academic publisher who specializes in your humanities-related books. You can use the code IvoryTower for 20% off on broadviewpress.com. So Sid's new book with Broadview Press is called AI in Writing. And as I'm on Broadview Press's website, I see that it's actually so popular that it's out of stock. But don't worry, it's going to be back in stock on June 21st. So make sure you get your orders in right now and get 20% off. So if you have questions about generative artificial intelligence, how to use it as a writing tool, whether you're an educator or you're a creative writer, he addresses all of the ethical, social, and material questions you have about using AI for writing purposes. And there's actually a free 37-page PDF on the AI and writing page on Broadview Press that talks all about the topic of AI and higher education. I highly recommend it. And while I'm recommending his book, I'd also love to recommend a new book published in April in 2024 called Academic Writing Now, A Brief Guide for Busy Students, written by David Starkey. And it is a reader and rhetoric combo. It's available as an ebook for under $30, and it includes readings on contemporary issues students care about, like AI, climate change, and campus life. 
I can't wait for you all to enjoy your Broad Free Press books. And if you're a classic novel reader like myself, Dracula, Jane Eyre, you name it, Broadview Press has you covered with classic novels as well. Remember, 20% off. Use the code IvoryTower, broadviewpress.com. You've heard me gush over my friend Christian Garcia's podcast called That Old Gay Classic Cinema. Yes, Christian Garcia, who hosts the Smash Rewatch podcast series with me. Remember Smash, where they're putting on a Marilyn Monroe Broadway musical called Bombshell? Well, make sure you listen to our podcast series. His podcast is called That Old Gay Classic Cinema, and it is definitely meant for all of those Turner Classic Movie lovers. So he looks at classic films with a queer lens. So think of him as a queer cinema professor of sorts. He actually had on co-owner of the Soapbox NY, Janine Cucci, to talk about Sunset Boulevard, which the three of us are just obsessed with Sunset Boulevard, and we can't wait for Nicole Scherzinger to be in the revival of Sunset Boulevard on Broadway. He also has episodes about Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, Strangers on a Train, now that definitely is a queer homoerotic film, The Philadelphia Story, Meet Me in St. Louis, Beauty and the Beast, Sweet Charity, Psycho Mary Poppins, Hello Dolly, The Wizard of Oz, Vertigo, which I actually was on, and 101 Dalmatians, and the list can go on and on and on. So make sure that you listen to That Old Gay Classic Cinema wherever you get podcasts, like Spotify or Apple. Follow Christian on Instagram at that old gay classic cinema. And he also has a TikTok. And please make sure that you reach out to him and let him know that you heard this ad on the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Happy podcast listening. Yeah. Well, just to say, uh, first of all, um, the trans element is interesting, and there were definitely there are definitely people I discuss in the book who probably, or at least perhaps, if they existed today, would identify as trans. There are people uh, I talked about the interwar ex servicemen's drag reviews, and then uh, after the Second World War, the phenomenon picked up again, and uh, you have uh, drag artists who participated in the post-Second World War ex-servicemen's drag reviews, you know, they maybe would have identified as gender non-conforming men or camp men or Nancy's then, but then later in life they identified uh, as trans as that kind of cultural language became more uh, popular. So I do talk um, a bit about, you know, of course, being trans and being a drag performer are you know, different things, but there are trans drag performers, you know, and have been historically. So I talk about that. Yeah, you mentioned the, um, um, uh, and correct me if this wasn't what you're saying, but sort of the things like um, uh, in The Nutty Professor and mm -hmm. Big Mama's House with Martin Lawrence, and maybe you could also talk, say, uh, the Medea films yes. with Tyler Perry. Um, although I would def differentiate those performances a little bit, because for instance, the Medea films, he is invested in the character, I think, Tyler Perry, you know, it is sort of a joke that he's a man playing a woman character, but he's so invested in the character that I think um, it goes beyond the main joke isn't, the, you know, drag or cross-dressing aspect but actually so one of the very first um films in which you had a man playing a woman character was uh, wallace beery who i think he might have been a wrestler he was at least a very big man and the joke was he was playing a, a woman swedish maid um, uh, Sweetie, the Swedish Maid. These films were in the, I think they started, there were a series of short films and they started in the 1910s, I think the late 1910s. So the joke of, you know, a very masculine presenting man playing a woman character uh, has been around for 
quite a long time. Um, and then you have, you know, it, the dame role in British pantomime. Um, one of the origins of that is uh, plays in which a male character dressed up as a woman in an ungainly way as a sort of disguise. Um, so, of course, in, you know, British pantomime, um, with the pantomime dame, oftentimes the joke is it's, it's quote-unquote, obviously, a man playing a woman. Um, but um, one interesting thing, and of course that's a part of uh, what I discuss in the book, but what's interesting is a lot of the performers I discuss, even when they were doing comedy, they were quite invested in either creating a believable character or... Um, uh, or displaying, you know, a, a very alluring representation of femininity. So, for instance, uh, in the book, I uh, I mentioned the ex-servicemen's drag reviews of the second, the post-Second World War period, and um, these shows, you, you know, involve very broad comedy. You weren't going in there to be, you know, uh, illuminated in an intellectual way. It was just, mm -hmm. you know popular variety entertainment um so the performers didn't necessarily need to um put on a very alluring display of femininity but they did if you look at the um the advertisements for these shows um you would totally they could easily fit in in a lineup of uh, 1940s and 1950s pinups um, and uh, Hollywood glamour girls and stuff. So um, and uh, so even when they were doing comedy, a lot of these performers really uh, worked hard and uh, that technical skill was acknowledged in reviews of the shows. So for instance, with the ex-servicemen's drag reviews, um, you uh, uh, the reviews would often note that these were ex-servicemen, so that was part of the appeal. But the main appeal of the show was just was seeing guys dress up as hot women, basically. And part of the fun was being taken in by these performers and having a sort of temporary crush <laughs> on them, um, if you were uh, an ostensibly heterosexual man. Um, so... Um, uh, and then also, you know, I talk about pantomime dames and I talk about the work of Dan Leno and Arthur Lucan, who, even though they were pantomime dames and people think of pantomime dames as a sort of almost like clown character, they really put in a lot of work um, in terms of creating a believable character. Arthur Lucan, um, he had radio shows. I, in the book, I talk about drag on the radio and gra drag on gramophone, which is maybe perhaps surprising to people who think of drag as a visual medium. Um, but Arthur Lucan would come into uh, recordings of his radio show in full costume and having memorized the lines and everything. So, um, so yes, uh, there has been an element of, oh, it's funny seeing, you know, a man who the audience knows is a man playing a woman, but, uh, many of the performers I cover really put a lot of work into their craft. And that was a main appeal, a main draw of the shows. When Arthur Lucan died, for instance, you know, the headline says old mother said old mother Riley dies. Uh, Cause a lot of people didn't know. A lot of people thought genuinely an old woman was, <laughs> you know, in these films and plays and radio productions. So, um, so people did uh, really put a lot of effort into making believable portrayals. Well, and then you have like when um, Dame Edna passed away, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like how it's always Dame Edna is the brand or mm -hmm. RuPaul, right? How many mm -hmm. it's always RuPaul and not really figure like not connecting um, who RuPaul is behind all of the drag. Mm -hmm. like, that is what we think of in terms of the performance, the reality show. And I'm just curious, do you, I know you don't talk about the current, you know, moment in your book, but I'm sure you must be such a consummate observer of drag in our culture. Do you think that there's been really large strides taken if a RuPaul's Drag Race has 
such a large audience and is a touchstone for a lot of straight audiences. Like they, you know, root for their favorite drag performer. They, you know, call them women. Like they are starting to mm -hmm. understand the nomenclature. But do you think RuPaul's Drag Race is different than say, um, is it sanitized in a way for the public's consumption? Is it something that people can understand, say compared to other forms of drag that might happen on Fire Island or P-Town, like ones that are more tied to eroticism with the queer community that a straight audience might be uncomfortable with that isn't as Hollywood glamorized? Yeah, thanks for your uh, question. Um, and thanks for assuming I'm a consummate observer. I, d I, I do like to take naps. So for at least 30 <laughs> minutes each day, I'm not observing because uh, my eyes are closed. But uh, when I'm not taking a nap, I'm observing. Um, and um, I, uh, well, so, okay, let's talk about RuPaul's Drag Race first. So full disclosure, like, I do still watch the occasional episode of Drag Race, but I kind of stopped watching it around season five. And uh, it wasn't, I wasn't like boycotting it or <laughs> anything. I just sort of, the luster wore off for me a bit. I think I maybe liked it better when it was a conscious parody of America's Next Top Model. I was just talking to somebody about this today because I think I find America's Next Top Model quite entertaining, or I found it entertaining in a sort of car crash sort of way. And I thought uh, it was, I just found RuPaul's Drag Race more entertaining when it was sort of a tacky send up of <laughs> America's Next Top Model. And as you say, now the show has become uh, glossier and more tightly produced, which is, you know, fine. I'm totally happy for people to still keep watching it. Um, uh, I admire RuPaul, despite his fracking sort of thing. I guess he's the Daniel Plainview of the drag world, um, but that's okay. I like Daniel Plainview too. Um, uh, but anyway, um, uh, so, um, but yeah, RuPaul's Drag Race um, is great. I think it sort of suffers from, I mean, I think obviously it attracts lots of critique for, you know, trans exclusion, et cetera. And I think those critiques are um, usually valid, um, but it also suffers from the fact, which as you indicated, it is the big drag show out there. So of course, you know, it uh, it's difficult for it to sort of handle that, that mantle. Um, I will say, you know, of course, I'm not, again, the book isn't trying to be contrarian. I'm not denying drags present day cultural moment. But I will say, for example, that I mean, for, uh, for instance, going back to um, La Rouge et Noir, who uh, did their interwar drag reviews, um, they were the stars, not just like side characters, but the stars of the first British produced talkie ever made. And these were like, we would describe their performance as glamour drag today it is still pretty recognizable as you know as drag uh, the drag you would see today and so that indicates that these people were super popular and ubiquitous um dan lino in the 19th century and early 20th century you know not all of his characters were um women characters but he was most popular for his uh, or kind of best he's at least best known today for his uh his, his dame roles and he was one of the most popular or if not the most popular entertainer in Britain at the time uh, you have I talk in the book about Danny LaRue who was totally ubiquitous on stage and television um, and made a, a not very good film <laughs> vehicle um, as well uh, had his own club uh, and he wasn't the only drag artist in central London to front his own club in the 60s so my argument is that drag um, in the past has had mainstream popularity. So I sort of see the uh, see RuPaul's Drag Race as a sort of continuation of that. You know, it's not that drag has become newly popular for the first time. There is a lineage of drag being very popular in the mainstream. Um, and um, I think RuPaul's Drag Race is... A part of that. Um, and I also talk about, you know, people say that RuPaul's Drag Race has made 
types of drag more globally homogenous. And to some extent, I think that's true. But I also talk in the book about global networks of drag, you know, for instance, as Hollywood was pushing out um, a, uh, say, one or a few types of glamour, um, drag artists, uh, especially in the West, were responding to that. So as the ideas of glamour, for example, become more globally homogenous, you have drag artists in Europe, North America, um, other places referencing kind of the same type of glamour and um, these uh, drag artists, you know, can present their acts for an audience in London or an audience in New York and um, both those audiences will respond well. Going back to the 19th century, for example, Ernest Bolton of the Bolton and Park case after the trial uh, went to New York and did his drag act there. Um, so uh, so there's long been this global network of drag, um, and it didn't just start with RuPaul's Drag Race. So again, not being contrarian, but trying to contextualize uh, what people associate with drag today. Yeah, well, I was going to say, here in the Ivory Tower boiler room, you can be contrarian, you can have your hot take. <laughs> that's where I can tell you're an academic because academics, when they come on this show, they get so nervous to misspeak. And I'm like <laughs> training them in the sense of you can have your hot takes. And it doesn't mean that it's representing the academic press you wrote for or your university. But well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not I'm not trying to be lawyerly, uh, but I will say, I mean, going back and this maybe sounds like a boring diplomatic uh, thing to say, but uh, going back to what I think about the current state of queer history, um, you know, uh, I'll I'll just say uh, my PhD kind of, I got going with my PhD proposal because I reached out to someone, I'll say him, Matt Holbrook. I reached out to Matt Holbrook um, and um, at Birmingham and I said, hey, oh, you don't reviews? know me, but I... Sorry, who oh, yeah. you and he wrote a blurb the on the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, he wrote a blurb for me, so that was very, very kind. Um, but I reached out to Matt Holbrook and I said, hey, you have no idea who I am, but I really like your work. Would it? Would you mind looking over my PhD proposal? And he was super nice about it and very helpful. And, you know, that's been the trend. Uh, whenever I reach out to people in my field, not only are they usually nice but they go above and beyond and uh, i want to pay that forward as well in my career so i have a great love for queer history as a discipline and for queer historians and you know maybe i'll disagree with some people's views and some people are welcome to disagree with me i would be i would be upset if i if no one else wrote a book about british drag after me i would love for people to be in conversation with this book and use this book as a springboard for their own studies. And if, you know, their studies disagree with me or mm -hmm. contravene something I've said, I'm happy for that as long as uh, I'm part of the conversation, honestly. Yeah. And as we enter into our like wrap up, I definitely uh, I'm going to pause because um, our ivory tower boiler room intern has a question that I definitely want her to ask, but sure, you know, everyone out there who's thinking, Andrew, you need to ask Jacob about the current moment with like book bands and the drag community being dragged. Sorry, that's a bad pun. Um, but you know, story hours, I'll get to all of that with you. Um, but Sarah, I know Sarah had like a drag race question, a Jason yeah. drag race question. So I just Sarah, want to say that if, if yeah. my book was banned in Florida, that would probably be pretty good for me. Yeah, so I welcome Ron DeSantis's wrath. Uh, yeah, it could be a good publicity moment. It would um, be a great publicity thing for me. Yeah. It'd be like when they stuck on the parental advisory labels and uh, that made the albums more popular. So Ron DeSantis, you're welcome to come after me. I know he is a listener, so. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, an avid listener. And, <laughs> you know, definitely we have to make jokes. I feel we have to be humorous in the chaotic moments. So, yeah. um, Sarah, definitely, I'd love to hear what you want to ask Jacob. Hi, yeah. Um, yeah, just piggybacking off of what you talked about drag race. I mean, 
for you know someone my age i i discovered drag race through the internet and through kind of uh you know i know trixie mattel has like a web series that that she does um uh you know bob the drag queen is also having their moment as well like i think just learning about drag race um and and the drag community through that context i think is super huge for people my age because i think there is kind of this preconception um that or this notion that drag race has never been mainstream and only now it's becoming big. But I mean, you're totally disproving that, um, which I think is amazing. Um, but, but yeah, it's kind of adjacent to drag race, but mostly RuPaul beliefs, because I feel like, again, people my age, he's like, RuPaul is like the center of, of the drag race conversation, which I don't think is fair, but it's kind of what it's become. Um, I know RuPaul has this opinion regarding women in drag uh cis women in drag specifically and i know it's a bit of a controversial topic but i just wanted to know your thoughts on it is there a place for women in drag is there i mean is drag kings is is that its own kind of category or are cis women in uh drag presenting as women it, it, you know there's there's different labels that we can kind of put onto it but i just want to uh to get your your view on that yeah thank you very much uh for your question um so uh, in the book, I do say at the end of the introduction, this isn't meant to nostalgically revere drag as it was in the past. You know, I'm not saying like kids have gone nuts with their drag these days. We need to go back to, you know, old mother Riley or Danny LaRue or whatever. Um, I think, um, one of the great things about drag, and I talk about this in the book, is drag is constantly adapting. You know, I say, as I mentioned before, um, when film first starts to become a popular medium, drag is at the forefront of that. Drag was at the forefront of the music hall and variety theater when those types of theater were developing. Um, drag was at the forefront of radio when radio first started to become popular, television, um, London, club life, etc. So I think it's great that drag continues to adapt. Uh, I'm all for a very inclusive uh, definition of drag. You know, I think traditionally the definition of drag just generally was uh, men dressing as women and women dressing as men for the in the context of performance. But my go-to definition of drag is a kind of performance that comments on gender. Obviously, other types of art can comment on gender too, but um, I think, you know, that's a pretty good go-to broad definition of drag, a kind of performance that comments on gender. And so that can totally include cis women drag queens, cis men drag kings. Uh, I don't really talk about people we'd call drag kings today. Um, in the past, they'd be called male impersonators. Um, and that's, uh, first of all, I didn't focus on them because uh, people like Jillian Roger have done great work on that area before. Are you looking for a new magazine to read where you can get so many books film and TV recommendations, well, then you need to check out the Gay and Lesbian Review. The G and L R is a bi-monthly magazine of history, culture, and politics that publishes essays in a wide range of disciplines, as well as a slew of reviews of books, plays, and movies, and a number of special features. Each issue brings you consistently intelligent, lively, thought-provoking articles focused on a unifying theme. So for example, their new issue for May and June is called The Celluloid Fishbowl. And it's a nod to Vito Russo's 1981 book called The Celluloid Closet, which documented the flashes of LGBT content in movies before Stonewall when such content was strictly forbidden. So there's so many exciting articles in the May and June issue, including one by Andrew White called Queer Ghosts on Oscar Night that covers so many different LGBTQ films, both when the characters come out of the closet and what happens when characters are already openly queer and they don't need to come out of the closet. 
like we're seeing with so much of TV and film and literature right now. There's also an article by Andrew Holleran, the acclaimed writer of Dancer from the Dance, who actually reviews All of Us Strangers, which I can't wait to watch and has been much talked about. So please make sure that you use the Ivory Tower Boiler Room code ITBR50 when you go on glreview.org. You'll see on the right side, it says subscribe. You can either subscribe for their digital edition or if you're like me, I like to still get the magazine uh, delivered as a print magazine. There's nothing just like having a print magazine in front of you. So use ITBR50 to get 50% off of your G&LR subscription. Yes, that's 50% off. So enjoy your reading. And please, if you are subscribing to the Gay and Lesbian Review, and if there's an article you really enjoyed or a review you really liked or a guest that you really want me to interview from the Gay and Lesbian Review, make sure that you DM me at Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Happy reading, everyone, and thank you to the Gay and Lesbian Review for their sponsorship. Spring has sprung here on Long Island, and I'm excited to talk about the Soapbox NY, a bath and body boutique located in historic Port Jefferson Village. My good friend Janine Cucci co-owns the Soapbox NY. Not only has she been on the Ivory Tower Boiler Room podcast, but she's also been on my good friend Christian Garcia's podcast. So... She gave me a special spring scent from her blending bar. You might ask Andrew, what is the blending bar? Well, it's what makes the Soapbox and Y so unique in my opinion. They have over 200 essential oils that can be made into shower gel, bubble baths, shampoo, body lotion, an essential oil roller, or even perfume. So the first scent that I want to highlight is called Peony Blush Suede, an exquisite floral with delicate rose and honey accents and a subtle green freshness. The second is Mimosa and Tonka with notes of sweet golden mimosa mixed with creamy tonka bean. And the third is Spring Musk, green and fresh with notes of bergamot, orange blossom, and neroli, a clean and fresh musk. So head over to SoapboxNY.com to place your order Make sure you follow the Soapbox NY on Instagram, where you also could DM Janine with any questions. And make sure you tell her that Andrew from Ivory Tower Boiler Room sent you. You've all heard me gush about Mandy Made It. Mandy Made It is a craft business, and it's actually owned by my friend Mandy Bengal, who I have known, married to Pippi has known. We all actually became best friends in main stage center for the arts summer theater camp. So I'm so proud of Mandy. First, she has a an arts festival coming up on April 28th. It's called the Gloucester Township Arts Market and Green Fair. There are going to be art vendors, craft vendors, including Mandy, food trucks. It sounds so much fun. I actually am thinking maybe I'm going to attend. So it's in South Jersey. And it's April 28th, a Sunday from 10 to 3 p.m. So go over to at Mandy Made It to find out more information about how you can attend the festival. And please, if you see Mandy, say, oh, I listened to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room, and that's how I know about your crochet company. So she makes so many wonderful items, especially because we're in the spring into summer. I know that she makes beautiful spring flowers that she crochets. She's made wonderful Pokemon inspired items. I know that my boyfriend, he's loves Pokemon Go. So this is a great item for him. I actually got my boyfriend, a Mandy made it scream ghost face bouquet for Valentine's day. He loved it. She makes wonderful Disney inspired items. She made me a hocus pocus bed and breakfast item, snow white and the Evil Queen's Poisoned Apple item. I know she's made Married to Pippi so many true crime items. We're in talks right now to have her make some Ivory Tower Boiler Room crochet items. Make sure that you reach out to Mandy Made It. Let her know that you heard this ad on the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. She loves knowing that you're listening to 
her ad on the podcast. And also she'll give you an exclusive item at Mandy Made It on Instagram and Facebook. And uh, and I do mention them for context, but they do have kind of a quite different history from people who were called female impersonators. And so um, I thought that would, so focusing on so-called male impersonators might, you know, be, uh, make the book just too broad. Um, and as I said, I didn't want to step on people's toes and those people have done great work like Jillian Roger. Um, but yeah, I'm all for an inclusive definition of drag. I think, um, new innovations in drag uh, have been great and uh, part of the reason why uh, the art form has persevered is because of its adaptability and um, so I'm obviously all for uh, drag as it is now and, um, and for it to become more inclusive and for it to have avant-garde forms and more mainstream forms and everything in between. Um, I think all of that is great. So even though I'm an old fogey, you know, I started watching a uh, drag on a mutoscope reels, so I would put in my nickel there. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm all for new innovations in drag. So uh, yeah. Well, and like to follow up, I love that question, Sarah, because in the back of my mind, Jacob, I was thinking what your book does so wonderfully is right yes you're showing the hyper exaggeration the campiness we can think of a rocky horror picture show with drag um how camp and drag always really become interconnected but i'm even thinking of a tyra bangs with america's next top model that viral moment where she was like tiffany i'm so disappointed in you or how could you do that tiffany we all believed in you right you. Yeah. yeah, that was like one of the best moments. But even like an Ugly Betty with Vanessa Williams or an Anna Wintour persona, that women also get really hyper exaggerated in terms of their campiness and become queer icons, right? Like, why do we love a share with her costumes and Madonna and Britney Spears? I mean, um, Katy Perry's Vegas show is really playing into camp that... I'm curious whether when you were looking at the periods you look at, it does seem that there's a question that we need to address, which is, is male drag performance deeply rooted in misogyny and sexism because women were really not allowed to be part of these spaces? Like, why did it take so long for women actually to be Shakespearean characters? They were performed by men. Like, there was not a female Juliet until... I don't know what, the 1700s, the restoration period. Mm -hmm. I think like yeah. with uh, Afroben really mm -hmm. brings in women on the stage. Late 1600s, I guess. Um, yeah, the late, late uh, 17th century was when uh, they started exactly. having women on the stage in Britain. It was in continental, it happened in continental Europe before. And you read like Pepys's diaries being like, I was in Venice the other day and I saw... Uh, you know, this opera had a woman in it. <laughs> yeah. So like, why, like, is the acceptability of male drag performers, like when they're seen as, right, that wrestler dressing up and it becomes a comedy mm -hmm. or the mm -hmm. men who are in Shakespearean plays, some of the female roles, you look at the lines and you see how outrageous some of their lines are. Not like the mm -hmm. ingenue, right? Not the ones who would have been played by, um, prepubescent boys like a Juliet mm. but you know um the nurse in Romeo and Juliet right that would have been a man and it's a comedic character why do you think that women on the stage even is it was threatening to the male gaze it was like threatening that women would be performers yeah thank you for that question well first of all uh you know as I said I'm in favor of new innovations in drag but I'm not in favor of new innovations in Shakespeare. I think only 13 year old boys should be playing Cleopatra. And uh, no, I'm just joking. Um, but um, yeah, you brought up a bunch of uh, thoughts there. So uh, tell, tell me afterwards if I didn't approach one of them. Um, but you talk about sexism and drag. And there's a sort of a mantra 
these days, drag has always been a protest or something like along those lines, declaring drag as being inherently progressive or inherently leftist uh, or uh, inherently an upending of gender norms for good, basically. And uh, I, people are welcome to have that definition, but I would resist that. Um, I think, for instance, um, in the U.S. Uh, in particular, you had drag in blackface minstrelsy. Um, you have people like Francis Leon, for instance, and uh, they would play, um, you know, sometimes they would play like, um, quote unquote, mammy characters, so sort of like pantomime dames, but they were also sexy, uh, glamorous um, uh, drag characters in blackface minstrelsy, like the so-called ha yeller gal uh, and the wench role. Um, so, um, and those are pretty recognizable as glamour drag. You know, there's actually, aside from the obvious racism, there's not like a, and you know, the fact that they're referencing 19th century glamour and not today's glamour, there's pr a pretty clear lineage there from glamour drag then to glamour drag today. So I don't think you can, I think it's quite difficult to make the argument that all drag is progressive. And also that means that, you know, first you need to see a drag show and then you need to consider where whether it's successfully progressive or not. And then you declare it drag. So that seems like quite a difficult <laughs> definition to manage. Um, uh, I think it's easier just to have a, you know, good broad definition. Um, but anyway, um, so has drag in the past been sexist? Is there sexist drag today? I would say yes. Um, just like any art form can have more conservative or reactionary iterations. I talk in the book, the third chapter is about so-called conservative drag, right? Um, so I think drag can be used for conservative ends and there can be progressive, cool leftist drag, you know? Um, so I guess, so people do ask me, is drag essentially sexist? And my argument of, in the book is drag isn't really essentially anything. So sexist drag is sexist, but drag is not inherently sexist. Um, uh, so going back to the Shakespearean boy players, um, I could have, I do talk about them in the book and I could have started there as like, you know, I know the beginning of the chronology. Um, I didn't focus on the boy players because I don't, th I think they're pretty removed from what our current idea of drag is. Of course, I'm sure there's some um, through line between the Victorian boy, uh, sorry, the, I, was I saying Victorian? I mean, the Elizabethan and Jacobian uh, boy players. Um, uh, I think there's some through line between, from the Elizabethan and Jacobian boy players to now, but I think, that's pretty far removed from our present day definition of drag in large part because acting was so different then compared to now. Um, you know, even when you have, so for instance, I saw Twelfth Night um, and they had, a, there, it was an all male cast, but e and you know, they made an effort to, I think the set was designed using materials they would have used in the, um, 17th and 16th centuries um but um uh it still wasn't like you know what you would see in an elizabethan theater performance because uh the type of acting then was just so different um you didn't have stanislavski you know influencing acting for example um but so yeah i think the victoria uh sorry again elizabethan and jacobian boy players are interesting but um, I wouldn't necessarily include them in a lineage of, you know, mm -hmm. modern drag and what we associate with modern drag, but people are welcome to disagree with me, as I said earlier. Yeah, well, and so how do you, like, you could quickly weigh in, but like, is the queer female icon of a hyper-exaggerated woman, like a cisgender woman, uh, like a share. Is that something new or has that always happened? The fandom around 
a woman who's not in drag, but she just becomes queer iconography. Yeah. Well, you have, you know, someone like Sarah Bernhardt, for example, who did play male roles and people really admired, in, you know, into her old age. She was very vigorous and very dramatic and, um, you know, and also I think uh, was a same sex desiring person in addition to being a gender nonconforming person. So um, they would have had a... Um, fan base of same-sex desiring and gender non-conforming people. People often, when you talk about the history of the so-called woman drag queen, people often bring up Mae West, because uh, Mae West was this hyper sex pot, hyper feminine, so very similar to, you know, what a drag queen might do, and also was very involved in drag culture. She wrote, before she, you know, was big in film, she wrote a play called The Drag, for instance, starring New York drag artists. So not only was she sort of like a woman drag queen, a cis woman drag queen, but um, she uh, was also very involved in contemporary drag culture. Yeah, well... And even though, right, there's always going to be critiques of Madonna's Vogue. Um, mm. Madonna also pays so much homage to the ballroom culture. Um, even, right, I guess the critique is she could have featured more of the actual ballroom players in her music video. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. she also brings it to the mainstream, right? So there's like this push and pull, I feel, in terms of anything that gets... Um, used in a Hollywood exposure mainstream way is how much yeah. are they actually amplifying the community? But, you know, one of my final questions is probably the one that um, is on everyone's mind. It's so prescient, but I'm sure you get asked it all the time, Jacob, which is right wing politicians have been doing drag. You mentioned the conservative element in British history, but just because Rudy Giuliani and Trump have been in drag doesn't mean that they're, you know, good actors of progressive values in the drag community. Like, you know, that's a clear yes. example. But also, so why is drag, do you feel like the drag community is being separated from the transgender community right now um, to pit them against each other by politicians? Um. Well, first of all, as somebody who uh, grew up in Brooklyn and came of age in Rudy Giuliani's New York, for better or for worse, when I see that uh, Rudy Giuliani Trump sketch where Trump is hitting on Rudy Giuliani in drag, I, it does actually make me feel kind of wistful and nostalgic. And there is a part of me that likes it if I take my head out of the present day <laughs> and, you know, just see them as characters rather than people who have ruined everything. Um, so um, I'll put that out there. In terms of the present day culture war over drag, I've written an article um, or two articles actually about th this topic. You can read them in The Telegraph uh, and Airmail. Obviously you can read them online and um, so um yeah, in The Telegraph and in Airmail, if you search for my name, I've written articles about this. Uh, I have various feelings about um, the present day culture war over drag. Obviously, I'm not in favor of people hating on drag, um, but I'm in two minds about whether to kind of think of this as a modern present day phenomenon and, or as just echoes of what we've seen before um you know for instance if you look at the statements people make about drag at these protests at these anti-drag protests a lot of them are you know they're using the same talking points that i uh you know, write about in my book you know you could take an angry letter to the lord chamberlain's office and compare it to what these people are saying um and Wait, just um, for clarification jacob are you talking about the the predator groomer type language predator groomer type language also for instance there was um i 
have maybe blessedly forgot their name, but uh, so there was a drag performer on um, British celebrity master chef. Uh, and I know you're clutching your pearls right now. How could they besmirch the great tradition of celebrity master chef, but they had a drag performer on there and a, a socially conservative organization in Britain said, drag isn't family entertainment. I can't believe they would besmirch celebrity master chef, etc. And um, I, and that's clearly not true. In the book, I talk about how drag artists were performing for children all the time. Um, and in fact, when the Lord Chamberlain, Britain State Theatre Center at the time, approved a play, that play could then be seen by someone of any age. Uh, they didn't have like an age rating system. So there were definitely kids seeing drag shows all the time in the uh, period that I discuss in my book, including obviously pantomime dames, which is like a staple of British children's entertainment. Um, so uh, I think oftentimes you see social conservatives in any era just glom on to some major um, bugbears that they have. Um, so... For example, I find it kind of weird, but uh, in the 80s, abortion was the thing that, you know, the moral uh, majority was glomming on to. Um, and even pre-Dobbs decision, but post-Dobbs decision as well, like, you know, they will, if you talk to a social conservative, they're probably going to say, I don't like abortion, but they're mainly motivated now by trans issues and drag artists and things of that nature. Um, so I feel like often social conservatives will just glom on to something that they see as like a perceived signifier of moral decay. And they just have happened to target drag now as uh, one of the things that they see as a signifier of moral decay. So, you know, and we sort of do it too, in a way, if on the uh, leftist or progressive side, however you want to define yourself, like, you know, when we see a rainbow flag in a shop, that, do of course, it means, you know, acceptance of LGBTQ identities and issues, etc. But we also see it as sort of a shibboleth for a whole bunch of other sort of progressive values. And so similarly, I think, social conservatives are up in arms about drag in particular because they see it as smutty sexual entertainment. And you see in U.S. states, um, the oh, many states and localities want to um, put dra drag in the same category as strip shows, etc., because they see it as inherently sexually loaded entertainment. Um, and, um, uh, but I think, so I think, you know, they genuinely might not like drag, but also they see it as symbolic of social liberalism and more widely and other things they don't like. So it's both about drag, but also about drag as a symbol for various things they don't like and things social conservatives have not liked for centuries. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's almost a Trojan horse or yeah. some type of, it's a moniker for what it, it's not exactly what it stands for, but it's representative of this moral panic and yes. uh, boogie. It's a boogeyman yes. um, scenario. So, but like you're saying, this is not anything new and you've covered so many, you know, both. That's where I feel your book really, you know, drag a British history, Jacob, brings us through both the what was deemed acceptable by the government in Britain, but what was seen as perverse or pathological or questionable, like really these conversations haven't gone away and hmm. the target has just changed. Um, yeah. So Jacob, wow, what a conversation. I just to uh, add that goes for yeah. a lot, for instance, in the book I bring up, so, you know, especially as RuPaul's Drag Race was becoming popular, there are all these articles, drag is newly popular, drag is becoming popular now. And in the book, I talk about all these articles from 18, that pop up between 1870 and 1970 saying this drag thing is becoming popular, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of cultural amnesia around drag, um, both on the anti-drag side and on the pro-drag side. 
Yeah. Well, thank you so much for answering all the questions. Uh, thank you for the work you're doing. It's so important. Um, I can't wait to like have you back on again. Uh, you're welcome here anytime. So everyone thank out you. there, go to uh, the show notes and you will see a link to Jacob's book, Drag a British History, out by University of California Press. And uh, Jacob, how can everyone follow you out there on social media? Um, well, thank you very much for having me. It's been a real pleasure and a big honor. And thank you to your listeners as well. Um, people are, I try to not go on Twitter so much slash X because it makes me feel a bit sad. But um, I'm J underscore Bloomf. That's B-L-O-O-M-F on uh, X or social media site formerly known as Twitter. Um, I'm also uh, J underscore Bloom on Instagram. And uh, I'm also on LinkedIn if you want to be very white collar. <laughs> oh, great. Well, thank you so much, Jacob. And uh, happy you. holiday season, everyone. Hopefully you're, Thanks. you know, inspired now to you know, look at a Mae West film or there's so many holiday movies. We now can start to just explore Jacob's analysis of drag, uh, you know, for good and for <laughs> good and bad, uh, whatever way you're analyzing the performance. So thank yeah. you, Jacob. I hope you have a As great Cole Porter season. said, if Mae West yeah. you like or me and dressed you like, nobody will oppose. Oh, OK. Wait. Oh, that's such a good that's anything goes, isn't it? Yes, that's right. There you go. A nice musical right. reference to end <laughs> out this holiday episode. OK. Yeah. And thanks to Sarah for her question. OK. Bye, thanks Jacob. Have a great day. Thanks so much for everything. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.